Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, Working Together to Create a More Resilient Community. This is the six in the series, and it is about wellness, integrative health care for pain management and treatment. In this segment, host Pat McDonald explores approaches to pain management and addiction treatment that reduce or replace the need for opioids. This requires education for prescribers and patients and improves screening for patients, strategies that are underway and highlighted by the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council. Hi, this is Pat McDonough, and I want to thank Jolinda for the introduction. As Jolinda mentioned, this show is about the use of non-pharmacological approach to pain management uh, for addiction treatment and recovery, and is also about patient education regarding options and risks in pain management. And we have, uh, Ben Kinsley is here with us today, co-host and co-producer, and we have got three very special guests who are highly qualified to talk about this subject. And it's Dr. Josh Plavin, Chief Medical Officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Doctor, how are you? Hi. Good, welcome. Dr. John okay. Porter, on the other side here of the room, of Medical Director of Comprehensive Pain Program. I have to talk later, Doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Commissioner, uh, Mark Levine, of, of Vermont Department of Health. Um, so I would like each of you, we ask our guests to talk a little bit about themselves, just so our audience has a flavor for who you are, and um, how your work that you're doing now ties into our discussion tonight. So, Dr. Sure. Flake. Sure, I've a, a, been a practicing uh, physician in Vermont for almost 20 years. Uh, I've, I've been at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Plan for only about three, three and a half years before that, I was in the central Vermont area as a primary care physician. I worked as an ER doc and a hospitalist, mm. and I'm an internist and a pediatrician, so I kind of do family medicine. Uh, and so I managed many patients with chronic pain right. uh, as part of my uh, longtime job in primary care um, and recognized a lot of the barriers that were, and issues that we're trying to address 
So that informs a lot of the work that I, I'm trying to do at Blue Cross Blue Shield of right. Vermont right. in partnership with uh, my colleagues to the left and throughout the state. That's right. there's, I've noticed there's a lot more partnerships these days, and I'd like to talk about that later. It just seems to be working more closely together and better these days. So, Commissioner? Yes, uh, so I'm an internist as well uh, and practiced uh, general internal medicine literally up to the day I began my commissioner work. Uh, and as a general internist, uh, did a lot of preventive medicine, uh, screening for disease and chronic disease management. And all of those actually feed into the topic we're going to talk about uh, with opioids. Um, but I also did a lot of screening for mm -hmm. other substances, you know, more commonly than opioid, mm -hmm. such as nicotine, alcohol, uh, marijuana, right. um, using um, a technique called SBIRT, which is screening, yes. brief intervention, referral to treatment, though we didn't really call it that, we just kind of did all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd like to disseminate that model even further. Currently, as health commissioner, obviously the opioid crisis is a big focus of the health department, a big focus of my alcohol and drug abuse program right. division right. at the health department, and clearly it's in the media all the time, but more importantly, it's in the lived experience of people in the public. Right. And so everybody in every community has been touched in some way by it, which really elevates the level of uh, importance it assumes uh, for all of them. As part of my role in uh, health commissioner, I'm also a member of the governor's opioid coordinating right. council. Right. Um, and there are regional coalitions throughout the state, and I sit on the executive <coughs> council of the Chittenden County Opioid Authority. Oh, wow. And um, there's, a, there's just so many activities going on that I'm sure we'll get into as we discuss. Yeah, I, I said this at the last show we did on enforcement, that when Governor Shumlin used his whole state of the state speech Mm -hmm. I mean, myself and my little circle of friends, we have no clue where we live. I mean, we're just not, we had no idea. And we were wondering, why, why is he doing this? And we found out pretty quickly after that this is huge mm -hmm. and how serious it is. And it's everywhere. I, and I just, that was a lesson for me because I'm like, what is he doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, he was doing the right thing. So, um, Mr. Porter. Yes, and I am a family physician. Um, I practiced for a number of years in Bennington um, and then... Ah about 20 years ago came up to work at the university in the family medicine residency and subsequently at the University of Vermont. And since December I have been working to put together the program to, um, that we hope will kind of approach uh, the issue of chronic pain for folks in a way that, that finds more success than we uh, have had to this point uh, right. using an integrative approach. Right. So. so that's really fascinating. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Good. So go ahead. Well, there's so much we can talk about on this subject, uh, but Commissioner, let's start with you. Could you summarize from your perspective um, where we are at with the opioid crisis and um, kind of how we got here? Yeah, maybe I'll do that in the reverse order. Uh, sure, How yeah. we got here. Um, and a lot of times people focus on one big area and say this is the problem, but it's really a multi-pronged kind of issue. So the health professions play a big role, uh, individual predisposition plays a big role, uh, ec economics plays a role, society plays a role. Uh, so starting with the health professions, obviously um, there was, and to a less degree still is, an epidemic of overprescribing mm. of opioid medications by the prescription route. Uh, no one's denying that. If you ask people who are immersed themselves in the disorder of opioid use, um, they'll tell you that four out of five times it began with the prescription drug use. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean that the prescription that was written for them <coughs> got them into trouble, although that may have been the fact. Most often, it turns out, perhaps as much as two-thirds of the time, it was by diversion. And mm -hmm. that's why in Vermont we have these campaigns kind of, uh, called most uh, dangerous leftover campaigns because it's the things that are still hanging around the medicine cabinet mm. that either get stolen, borrowed, um, diverted by um, you know illegal or legal means to susceptible people. Um, and so a big thrust of what we've done in Vermont with new rules about how to prescribe these is making sure people are really tuned into the right quantity, mm. right. the right dosage, and that initial prescription 
only enough pills that are needed as opposed to a 30-day supply for something that might have only needed 48 hours worth of treatment. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, clearly part of the way we got into this. There was also uh, the culpability on the part of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, specific companies and distributors who really misled the healthcare professionals into thinking that these drugs had low addictive potential when in fact they have very strong addictive potential. And then there was uh, some misconception about uh, the utility of these drugs for management of chronic pain. And I know Dr. Porter is going to get into his <coughs> clinic later on, right. but at the same time, uh, for a long time, people felt that uh, we were helping people who had chronic pain with something that was useful for them, not harmful, and we didn't have many alternatives uh, in their place. So opioids became the natural default, if you will. Mm. And the whole thinking on that has changed, needless to say. But having said all that, we don't want to take away from genetic and biological predisposition. We don't want to take away from the fact that uh, there are these so-called social determinants of health that um, really uh, create what we term diseases of despair, like substance use, alcohol use, etc. Um, and this is related to, you know, socioeconomic issues like poverty, uh, education issues, social isolation, things of that sort, um, and these toxic stresses that young kids grow up with, depending on the environment that they're brought into, uh, where there may be abuse in the household, there may be someone who has a uh, disorder of substance use, there may be someone incarcerated, etc. All of that combines into sort of uh, how we got there in a sense. Um, and originally there was a lack of really good access to treatment. Uh, now there's really good access to treatment yeah. of opioid use disorder, so we've taken care of that aspect of things. Um, people converted, if you will, from the oral prescription drug route to the intravenous heroin, and now unfortunately much more dangerous fentanyl routes, uh, really through economic concerns. Uh, these, these are cheaper than getting prescription drugs. They're often easier for people to obtain uh, illegally than, than the legal route in a, in a clinician's office. And the supply of heroin uh, was abundant. Uh, and so it required a whole host of new law enforcement strategies to try to grapple with that as well. So all of these factors kind of came into play. The impact on the population of Vermont is been quite substantial, as you were mentioning by the uh, state of the uh, state address from years ago. We currently have about eight to nine thousand people in treatment. Um, widely uh, not known, but nationally uh, derived figures tell us that at most two or three out of ten people who have an opioid use disorder are getting treatment. That means there's a whole host of people out are there not. that are actively using drugs and not actually getting treatment. Right. So if you look at the universe in Vermont, we could have as many as 20 or 30,000 individuals in the state total who uh, have this problem. And it has this huge impact on everyone, as I alluded to earlier, so that's why community coalitions develop, etc. Its impact can also be measured in just mortality. Um, there are two Vermonters a week, on average, who are dying uh, of an unintentional overdose. That's about 100 a year. There's also this huge impact on kids. And when I have my colleagues in the Department of Children and Families uh, show me their statistics, it turns out that in the last two years, 50% of children ages 0 to 5 that are in the custody of the state, of the Department of Children and Families, were attributed to uh, opiate use uh, issues in their family. Yeah, and that's I'm, I'm about very, 500 kids yeah, a year. I'm very involved in Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. I'm on the board. Yeah. And our numbers have gone up, but it's not from abuse. It's from neglect. Because exactly. when, when you're on the opioids, you just sort of... You can't care for you, your you kids can't care for them. So that's why the numbers are going up. And we had them down for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And now they're right back up right. again. Yeah, it's and, bad. And especially in the zero to five-year-old uh, Range, yeah, right, which right. is a real tragedy. Right. Yeah. So enough on the impact. Yeah, I, I hope that answered your question. That was a very going, thorough, uh, that very thorough answer. Thank you. It's it's amazing um, all of the aspects of you know just regular day life in Vermont that um, this impacts. I don't know, Dr. Porter, if you have any anything to add to that in terms of the the treatment and 
um, and diagnosing of the the issue. Yeah. Well, I, I I would I think that was a very comprehensive response and thoughtful response on Dr. Levine's part. You know, I think we in the allopathic uh, medical field have something to to kind of carry here as far as um, as wishing that we had perhaps done better critical thinking right. um, and designed systems that responded um, better to individual conditions. So when somebody comes into the office with a complaint of chronic pain, you know, I think given the way our systems have been set up um, historically, typically you give a pill. If it's a strep mm -hmm. throat, right. you give a pill. And if and you so, don't, we feel neglected. And that's right. And <laughs> we don't <laughs> like it if you don't do that. Yeah. But I, I do think... It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to look at how we're practicing and how we can really um, kind of move towards a more patient-centered approach. Um, and, and so that's what we're all working on. That's great. Dr. Plavin, um, I just want to ask a little bit different question about Blue Cross Blue Shield, where you work. How has that been impacted by the opioid crisis? I went on your website and there's, I think there's a lot of policy changes, medical changes. You've really been active in, or somebody in Blue Cross up at the State House. Yes. Trying to um, swerve some things around and, and being responsive. So the so Blue Cross has been engaged with the opioid epidemic writ large since 2002 right. um, when it was the heroin epidemic. So we have been right. so um, intervened in over time yep. in raising awareness, provider outreach and education, early intervention, and, and in recovery. Yeah. Um, and so we had supported Bess O'Brien's. Uh, oh, films sure, that you're right. familiar yeah, with right. here today, The Hungry Heart, yep. and the tours, yeah, the tours throughout the, 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 the state, which were very um, engaging. We uh, also support the Voices Project, which is the voice of youth, right. and ended up being a, a play. Um, it was uh, videotaped and available, um, and a book as well called Listen and a oh, CD nice. called Listen. And then more recently, we worked with Vermont PBS to, re, uh, to have further community dialogues, and we uh, re-televised, if you will, here today in Hungry Heart uh, with Bess nice. as yeah. well. So that's on the raising awareness side. Yeah. Um, in regards to the, the current um, kind of uh, partnerships, we had actually been planning on on starting to address this institutionally at the same time when at that at that time the commissioner was uh, Dr. Chen, Dr. Chen right reached out to us and and said hey we're, we're actually putting together a, uh, a statewide task force we'd like this to be multi-payer and have everyone engaged and we said sure great. that sounds like a great idea so we met with him and other payers um, and then eventually got involved in the statewide OBA uh, task force mm -hmm. and, and in the end what we did was we operationalized the guidelines that were agreed upon. So having guidelines and rules are one thing, enforcing them and making them real is another. And so um, what we have found is that uh, we, when we have put hard stops in the pharmacies mm -hmm. for someone mm -hmm. who is opioid no. naive, never right. had a medication before, right. maybe just had a procedure and was given a prescription for 30 tabs, right. well, the new rule in the in the system says no more than seven days, no more than so much mill right. equivalents of, of medication, and it will stop it right there before right. it's dispensed. What we found uh, is that that actually has further decreased. We've seen an overall decrease in opioid use. That has further decreased that by about 20% um, by actually operationalizing the rule within your systems. Um, and, and so that took some doing, but um, we continue to uh, uh, improve on those. We have new policies mm -hmm. around long-acting opioids. We are having meetings about next steps. That's what we want to do as a state, and how can we help to operationalize those decisions. Because patients are also at high risk of overdose, um, whether on high doses, yeah. when they are uh, have co-prescription of sedating medications. Mm -hmm. So we're very concerned about that, and we do a lot of uh, monitoring and outreach to providers. How many physicians do you have at Blue Cross Blue Shield who maybe are monitoring all of these interactions of drugs and? So we have two pharmacists and basically yeah. three physicians. Oh wow! Um, and not full time. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and so yeah I, yeah, I make a lot of the calls myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and then the other thing is mental health. The interplay of of mental health diagnoses 
and, um, and both chronic pain and then uh, opioid abuse right. and the untreated underlying issue. Exactly. Um, exactly. And so that, that's something we also consider a risk factor and uh, work with our So you families. deal directly with, with uh, your, your clients, your customers. Um, do you call them and talk and do you have people follow up with the patient? Uh, we the, work through the provider. Through the provider. There are some yeah. federal rules around. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. we work with the provider as, as much as possible. Um, and we don't want, certainly don't want to get, never want to get in the way of the physician, right. um, you know, uh, patient relationship. Right. And so oh, we want to augment that. That's important. Yeah. Well, we think Blue Cross Blue Shield is a wonderful community partner. So thank you very much. Then you had some questions. Yeah. So there's, um, you mentioned the, the role that you're playing working with state and in some cases federal um, officials and programs trying yeah. to um, address this crisis. And there's three critical pieces, uh, in my understanding, to that um, to that relationship. And it's ensuring patients receive the right care in the right setting, providing states with sufficient resources to address the epidemic, and uh, addressing the fraud and abuse that's harming people who need help. But that one, um, we can probably expand on a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, you know, and, and so, so right time, right place. There, there. there we, we actually have a, um, a very robust case management program, nurses and social workers and mental health and licensed alcohol and drug counselors who uh, work with our members who uh, are struggling with, in recovery uh, and uh, also for all sorts of other chronic conditions. Um, it's unique because we're actually uh, a provider payer partnership with the Barbara Retreat. And, and so we're completely integrated between mental health and medical. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we have lots of different programs to support patients in recovery. One of the things we found was that when patients are um, first identified with opioid misuse disorder um, and they're started on MAT or medication assisted treatment at a hub, sometimes there's a gap between the hub, the central kind of stabilization uh, facility and what's called the spoke, which is the community provider right. who takes on their care once they're stable. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people fall through the cracks. So what we've done is actually put in a case manager in the middle to make sure and ensure that members get right. kind of from the hub right. to the spoke, if you will. Right. Um, and we were the first pair to actually uh, contract with all the hubs, pay them at a bundled rate, break down a bunch of barriers around finance, which include things like um, people who are initially on uh, medication-assisted medication treatment are often given daily or weekly dosing. Um, and we, were, uh, we realized that the way that the benefit structure was designed was not um, to the benefit of the patient. And so we prorated the quote-unquote copay, oh. um, whatever the portion of the, the, the patient might need, and need to pay, um, so that um, they weren't kind of stuck with that every time they filled the prescription, right. um, among other things. Uh, we do support ESPERT um, actively and do um, support training and expansion of that throughout the state. That's the early intervention, early diagnosis, and harm reduction model uh, for, for substance misuse in general, I would say. Um, and uh, we're expanding that model as well. And lifestyle misuse. Yeah, in terms exactly. Of exercise, diet, all oh, those things. Oh, please, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the, on the, on the, uh, other side, um, we're working with Dr. Porter and also another site in uh, the Barber Retreat, actually, um, to stand up what we like to think of centers of excellence. So just like we have a hub and spoke model for uh, opioid misuse and medication assisted treatment for chronic pain, we don't have a system to adequately manage our patients. And we in primary care often, if you will, left holding the the, the bill, if you will, mm. and, and not adequately trained to manage complex um, pain uh, syndromes like this. What we have historically done is sent patients off for consults to interventional pain clinics. They might get an injection, it might help temporarily, but in, in fact, much of that interventional care is not actually that helpful for patients. Um, and what we firmly believe is that there needs to be kind of a middleman uh, center of excellence or hub uh, and a series of these throughout the state to support patients and mm -hmm. Vermonters, right. um, as well as the medical system. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Porter's is, would be the first one that's mm -hmm. up and running. Right. The second one, the Broward Retreat, but we envision probably six to eight of these throughout the state. 
That's great. So yeah. kind of a, like a parallel structure to a the, parallel yeah. structure for chronic pain. It's a great lead into right. Dr. Porter because mm -hmm. um, we'd like you to talk about the sure. uh, comprehensive pain program, CPP. Yeah. I got it. CPP. Um, yeah, and I think we can go back and maybe uh, along the lines of what Dr. Plavin was saying, kind of take a systems look at how we have been doing this. And right. So you can imagine a patient who has been dealing with pain for many months or years yeah. on a, perhaps an opiate um, who may have a, a co-occurring mental health challenge, depression, anxiety, whose vocational plans may have been disrupted, whose mm -hmm. family system has likely been disrupted. Um, and, you know, in our traditional setting, um, having that person call and make an appointment for a follow-up visit, um, you know, which in a primary care setting often turns out to be a 15-minute visit. And they present to the office with, with this array of suffering right. um, around their chronic pain and, and leave, you know, probably experience a very transactional event, right? I'm here, here's what's happening. My pain is five out of 10 or, right. you know, eight out yeah. of 10. And, um, and, and so th they may well leave feeling like they weren't well served, frustrated, right. they, they don't feel much better. They may be having side effects from their medication regime. Well, somebody brought up the underlying, uh, I think you've talked about the underlying factors. A lot of pain, I think, is, is underlying factors which could trigger pain, correct? Is that? Um, well, I think we're learning a lot psychological about, about how the nervous system seems to behave in folks right. who have chronic pain. And there's, it's not as simple as, you know, I have pain in my back and, and the tissue may be normal in many respects, but there's pain there. So where's it coming from? And right. so we're looking at how to approach it in different ways. But if I go back to that scenario with the patient coming in with their chronic pain to a primary care setting and you go to the other side of the desk or the exam table, you have the clinician, you know, who has this patient with many needs and challenges, right. trying to take care of that in a 15 minute visit. That ends up being frustrating right, um, and for draining sure. for the clinician. And so I think one of the questions for us is with this condition, how can we really um, try to develop a system that is patient centered, um, that uses a broader toolbox of options right. um, than, than we've had just with our traditional right. approach. So what is your plain, I can't say a pain clinic going to be doing? That's up in September. It's a new building at the university? Or um, it, there's new, a, new area? an area that's being renovated, yeah, okay. uh, about 9,000 square feet. It's on right. Philly Drive. And the intention is, first of all, to take care of the cohort of folks who have been seen at the pain clinic right. before the CPP came into being. Um, and, and offer them access to this. And then we'll open it up to the faculty practices in primary care, internal medicine, family medicine, and then beyond that within right. the system. Um, and for many folks who go through that, as we put this program together, this will be a 12-week so-called episode of care with wow. a weekly time for patients to come. Nice. Um, and during that time, each week, they'll get some education about what's happening with their body in this process. They'll have a chance to do some movement. Um, they'll have access to other modalities, be introduced well, to other I was going to ask, do you have like massages there and other uh, things so, there at the facility? So this facility will have physical therapy, oh, occupational therapy, yoga therapy, um, massage therapy, acupuncture, and then some mental health approaches that are designed to help uh, folks kind of gain some new skills. That's great. So I think going back here you know the idea is for folks who have been in pain and it and i i think we use the word chronic pain for me the the more accurate word is suffering right there's pain centrally right. but there's suffering all right. around that sure. that often leaves people isolated and so the intention is to help folks articulate meaningful goals for themselves mm -hmm. about what they would like to be doing and it may not as opposed to the old days when it would be I want to increase the range of motion in my shoulder to 90 degrees, right, which would be a traditional kind of medical approach. It may be I want to get on the floor with my grandchild and play, you know, or I want right. to be able to get out to the store. Or, But using those goals and then working with staffs who, who, a staff who has expertise in these various modalities, uh, helping people well, get Don't there. you think people have a, um, they think zero is good. I've yes. had this discussion on the show before. When they, every, every time you go yes. into the doctor's office, they say zero to ten. Yes. Where is your pain? Right. Well, if somebody presents zero to you, you think, I should have zero. Yeah. 
Yes. I remember growing up and they said, you just had surgery, of course you're going to be in pain. Yes. And they gave you aspirin or something and, and it didn't go, it didn't go to zero. Maybe mm -hmm. it went to four. Yeah. It, does that, I think that doesn't help. Well, I think that is a the very tr real point. And at the same time, um, you know, to tell somebody who's had chronic pain that you're never going to be pain free yeah. is, is tough. And yet I do think that's part of the work yeah. because we know in this, in this area of endeavor, if, if folks make 30 or 40 percent improvement in terms of comfort level, right. in terms of functional level, that's a home run right now. Right. So I also think we've given folks some signals that, you know, we just got the right formulation right. or the right medicine. Right. We can I'll do this, dead. right? Mm -hmm. But people really deserve. Maybe to, you should have started it at two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even even that pain chart that we use, right. you know, is so one-dimensional, right? It doesn't, exactly, because there's a lot more to, to ha and yeah, I don't never know how to fit it in. But I was thinking maybe it's helpful to the doctors to hear from the patient, better, worse, and it was um, four last week and yeah. six this week. That would help. But I think that I think zero it's a shorthand that has some effort, some use yeah. for sure. Okay. But I think. Again, in terms of that broader sense of how are we doing here with life, how, what skills are we able to provide right. with you or access to modalities that you didn't know would help and they seem to be helping. Right. So. That's a cultural change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. and when it was introduced as the fifth vital sign right. um, and the regulators caught on to it mm -hmm. um, and Jaco actually uh, required some yep. right. documentation right. thereof, that did not help um, because again, it was addressed in too simplistic mm -hmm. fashion. Uh, and it's a, it's a more complex issue and is focused on um, your experience of suffering, mm -hmm. which I do like better than pain, um, and, and your goals for your function. Um, and uh, so I think uh, it's not just us that have to change, mm -hmm. but the entire culture to some right. degree. Right. And Interesting. Uh, just to piggyback onto that, it, it was as another component of how we got into the epidemic, the over-reliance on this as a quality measure that almost force clinicians into prescribing more and more. Um, but it all stems back to, I think the word is expectations. Yeah. I... So perhaps we as prescribers may have had unrealistic expectations yeah. of how to manage the pain, but those coming in with pain and suffering, um, you know, with our high tech uh, sure. healthcare Expect system, miracles. everyone expects that the expectation is I will go from 10 to zero. Right. and. Uh, the condition I have, I don't have to live with that the rest of my life because it'll be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And we're learning that actually we can help you live with that in very productive ways mm -hmm. um, if you work with us in, in the settings that you've heard yeah. described. There's, there's so um, much, if there's so much going on, you have to worry about drug interaction. And I mean, there's so much right. stuff right. you have to worry about. And, and I don't think, uh, and Dr. Porter can, can chime in on this, the promise of this clinic is not that every person who's been on opioids chronically for their life is going to be suddenly off of opioids or that it, the approach is even going right. to be to drastically right. reduce their opioids uh, and make them uncomfortable. It's to really augment uh, the, the system built around them to help them cope with their pain and suffering, mm -hmm. which may perhaps allow a reduction in dose of the opioids. Right. I actually look at the true promise uh, of the centers that as uh, are being described uh, for the people who haven't yet become chronic opioid Correct. need oh, patients. Right, right. They have pain and need help managing it. Their physicians need a hub, as was described, that they can be referred to to really help with a holistic, integrated right, approach right. around that pain. And they never get into the slippery slope of requiring more and more opioids. Because a lot of these pharmaceutical pain. companies said that wasn't addictive when they first right, that introduced was a problem. it. That was they sort of right. told a little fib. There was a little fib, yeah. and that's why numerous states well, have outright uh, lied. Outright. Okay, thanks. <laughs> just, yeah. just go. Outright lied. Yeah. Yeah. Like the tobacco uh, guys have uh, lawsuits now <laughs> right. because of that. Right. Well, there's a national yeah. class action lawsuit around. There is. Yeah. Right. yeah. right, but I do see that, the promise as being in a more opioid naive population that they never get there. Right. And then people who maybe were thinking that just taking a drug will help everything that's wrong with them uh, have a different kind of approach that right. can be productive for them. I think that's a very important delineation and I, I've talked to a lot of um, audiences and there are people, people who have chronic pain who are on chronic opioids who are stable mm -hmm. have no reason mm -hmm. to think that anyone's going to take quote unquote, take it away from you. Mm -hmm. um, if it's helping your function and you are, you are stable, there's no reason to do so. 
Now, when we've looked at these types of clinics, which do exist uh, throughout the United States, somewhat spottily, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, overall in the whole population that they see, about, there's about a 20%, 30% reduction in, in total opioid oh, prescriptions. Great. But that doesn't mean any individual patient will be um, will have a reduced dose. It's their choice right. as they choose to uh, find alternative means right. of treatment. So and how do people come to your clinic? Do, does my doctor say you should go to the um, CPP or? That's, this will be on referral. And oh, again, okay. initially it will be from the faculty practices up at UVM. Yeah. Um, but it will be on referral. And it will be a referral service. We'll, we'll take folks in, work with them, communicate right. with uh, the mm -hmm. medical home. Um, and then the other, there are two other important parts to the, to the program. One is that at the end of that 90 day or 12 week period, we don't want people just to kind of fall off the edge of the mm. table. So we'd like them to continue to maintain and build the skills that they, that they have um, right. with the work they've done in those first, right. um, in that first foundational event. And the other part we're working on is a track for folks who are in primary support roles. Could be a partner, spouse, oh, might yes. be an older child. I could talk about that. My husband had back surgery in mm -hmm. November, mm -hmm. so that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's going to a pain clinic next week, so yes. there you go. Mm -hmm. wow. But again, in, in the sense that this is a, uh, a three-dimensional problem yeah. for, you know, and great. challenge for family systems. Um, yeah, because I think that's because sometimes pain, you can't see pain sometimes mm -hmm. um, and I think it's good for the caretaker to understand what's really going on and yeah and, and to have a sense of what, of what the patient is right. learning and also right. probably to get some ports in, yeah. in a cohort experience That's a good right idea. because it's it is its own yeah. it is its own challenge the other just going back to the cultural change issue in in our traditional way of kind of working with chronic pain it has been transactional it has been one in which the patient's options are limited right and so what we would like to do is to increase uh, patient self-efficacy at kind of picking right. out things that work for them right. and their agency in, in terms of engaging the medical system. Right. And uh, I think that's probably, and we will have to see if this is borne out, but it, I, there's reason to think that's a powerful way to help people move forward with a, with a condition that's chronic. That's excellent, that's great. Ben, did you have a question? Well, so this is something that we talked about briefly. I think Dr. Porter, you had mentioned earlier um, about the new uh, facility that you're opening at UVM. Um, is psychological counseling being embedded in opioid treatment um, as, you know, that's part of the root cause of, um, mm -hmm. of addiction. Um, kind of to, to piggyback on top of that, uh, I, I'm curious to know how integrated the mental health um, and treatment, addiction treatment services are and, and how much crossover there is between um, addiction as well as other mental health um, issues. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so that's going to be, have, to be, have to be a required foundational prerequisite for these um, centers, uh, that it is, it is, there's a, uh, a medical component um, and a strong foundation in uh, psychological and mental health uh, component. Um, and, and so uh, your clinic mm -hmm. is going to have that as a foundation. The mm -hmm. clinic at the Barbara Retreat, in fact, is coming out of mental health. Right. Yep. Um, and in fact, are bringing in medical to them. Um, and, uh, and I think we all agree that, that that's, an, that's one of the most important things. Yeah. Um, is that true in, in almost all cases that there's some hidden, well, I don't want to say hidden, but there's some psychological issues there. Is that so? We would, in yeah, most cases, in a broad, or? in a broad sense, since we've studied this at Blue Cross through our claims and whatnot, um, in a, the chronic disease population, right. in which this is a chronic disease, mm -hmm. right. um, uh, uh, approximately, and it, it, it varies, uh, twenty percent of the population has a, a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. Oh. Those with co-occurring mental health diagnoses have a forty percent higher utilization and cost on the medical side. Right. So if you don't treat the mental health right. and don't get them access to services, you're never going to manage the chronic condition. Right. And we know that on a one-on-one -on -one basis with patients, yeah. but at a population level, we need to actually uh, build systems to address right. it. And if people don't fall into a frank mental health diagnosis, right, there are still issues that yeah. relate to their being in day-to-day -day life and skills that can be helpful um, in terms of helping them navigate effectively. And things that are chronic pain led to mm -hmm. that is true mental health distress, mm -hmm. whether it's frank right. depression or right. anxiety or what. 
Then in your original question, <clears throat> I think you were also looking at the overlap of mental health and substance use. Yes. That one, we don't have a hard and firm number, but numbers as high as <clears throat> 70% for coexistence of mental health disorders and oh. substance use disorder. Wow. Um, and we can and need to do a better job of addressing both uh, concurrently. The emphasis is clearly always on trying to relieve the addiction problem first and work on that, but really concurrently the mental health aspects need to be taken care of. Obviously for someone who has come in asking for treatment <coughs> for their opioid use disorder, the fact of the matter is state-of-the-art treatment is medication-assisted treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine predominantly, occasionally naltrexone. Um, and so that's going to be a given no matter what, but in the hub-and-spoke system, layered alongside that, um, for the person who wants it, it's not forced on anybody, are all kinds of support services uh, in terms of case management, in terms of counseling. Um, and certainly the recovery process is replete with re peer recovery counselors, licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors who want to continue to play a big role for that individual, whether they're remaining on MAT or not at that point in their recovery. Um, because uh, the coexistence is so great and the need for that kind of support is so great. Yeah, it's pretty stark uh, if, 70, if there's a 70% coexistence. Never, I didn't hear that yeah. before. And, I, and I want, one of the reasons I asked that question is because, you know, we understand that a lot of, uh, now we understand that many cases of opiate addiction are resulting from a medical, uh, a medical issue. They're either prescribed or got, you know, access to mm -hmm. opiates. Um, uh, but I think there is a, there's also a perception before we came to that realization that, you, that you know, people turn to addiction for issues um, related to depression or, or whatnot exactly. that are kind of outside the medical diagnosis piece of it. Um, right. And I don't know how, how great of an issue that still is compared to the medical piece of it and the, and the opiate piece of it, but, um, you know, there's a cer yes. certainly a number of factors at play. Absolutely. That's good. So I have a list of... Um, a list of treatments or types of treatments that I, I put them in questions and you all came back and said, well, this, this. So all I thought to do is just to list them and maybe some one of you can explain sure. them as, as we go through that because sure. I was getting a little confused. <laughs> so first is the integrative treatment and maybe, um, maybe you could be the best person to explain what is integrative treatment. It's what we've been talking about, I think. Yeah, and, and for me, integrative an integrative approach is one that combines an allopathic approach with other therapies. And what is allopathic? It's a, an MD. MD. Oh, yes. oh, okay. Yeah, or, or it could be an osteopathic approach. Oh, but, I see. But with other therapies and with mental health um, kind of uh, programs and services. So yeah. the intention is to bring a, a broader array of, of options and treatments. Which is different than the whole person care or same. Because we had a we had a question about that. And, and it's another I, way of framing. It's another yeah, way of saying another the way same. of saying. Because yeah. we're going to put up the uh, yeah. the wellness wheel from uh, from UVM. Because mm. I think that really just mm -hmm. kind of captures all of the components of the whole person. Mm -hmm. So. Because um, right. I think in the past, so often anything that wasn't allopathic, meaning the doctor who doctor. could write a prescription, whatever, yeah. was regarded as alternative or complementary, right. mm -hmm. and that meant any other person who saw the patient. Uh, they may have practiced chiropractic, they may have practiced acupuncture, they may have done uh, some uh, Far Eastern, you know, yeah. uh, modality. Right. It was all lumped in that. And it really wasn't a very uh, expressive way of describing what we really want, which is try to find the modality that's appropriate for the person and that will help them get better and become more productive in their it's life It's sort of good again. to see these modalities being risen up a little bit in, in right. recognition and, and, of their importance. And that's why to importance. use the word integrative is right. so much more powerful because right. it's really, it's not that what the allopathic canon does do didn't count anymore. And, and likewise, in the opposite direction, uh, if acupuncture was the best, it didn't discount that either. Right. They all can become a component of getting the person to a state of wellness that's greater than where they entered. Wow. But, but integrative is, in fact, care that is coordinated yes. with the patient at the mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, one could get chiropractic and acupuncture 
and go see Dr. Porter all separately. But better, one should get all those services in I what it. I like to call a transdisciplinary model. Yes. So it's not just multidisciplinary in that we're all sitting in the same room, but we're actually sharing our expertise, coordinating, that's great. coordinating it to find out what actually works right. for that patient yeah. to improve their function and achieve their goals. Right. And better, better answers can come out of that, out of that synergy. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that Absolutely. Because it's been really the chaotic model up until now. Right. Where well, if I, I, I didn't relieve. A lot of us think we're sort of in charge and yeah. have to if find If I our didn't own relieve paths, your pain, or which the prescription I wrote didn't relieve your pain, right. you'd say, "All right, I'm just gonna go see so and so, right. who's a chiropractor." And then if that didn't work, well, I'm gonna try acupuncture right. because I heard it might work. Right. right. And it's very chaotic. It's not very coordinated at all. And in the end, the person probably is getting very frustrated right. because they're yeah, independently doing one thing at a time in search of something that maybe we could find in a more coordinated mm -hmm. and compassionate way right. uh, through a, a clinic like you've heard described. Right. I have a great example of this. Um, I had a back injury a couple of years ago, um, when a lower spine injury, um, and I was seeing my primary care. Um, and then independently went to see a chiropractor yep. who then referred me to a pain management specialist. <laughs> and so I was seeing all three of these yeah. uh, clinicians at the same time, but fortunately they had some working relationship with each other already and they were able to kind of have some communication, but I can see the value of having all that under <clears throat> one roof. Um, and it was the combination of several different things that ultimately came to a resolution, but I can definitely see how that is yeah. you know, mm -hmm. preferable. So there's two more. One is evidence-based treatment, which I think is, is based on facts and, and assumptions and, and you know, results, right? Is that, is that what evidence-based no. treatment means? That's, do you want to? No, you start? guys can <laughs> start. <laughs> Everyone oh, jump in at once. Is this a bad one? Like, <laughs> no, it's a good one. <laughs> it's a great one. But, but yeah. you're, you're referring to evidence-based treatment in a chronic pain yes, person, yeah, so yeah. bringing other modalities yes. to the table. So what is, so 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 is evidence-based? To be very based? frank, we have some very strong levels of evidence for some modalities oh, I see. and some gaps in evidence for the others. And I'm saying gaps because it doesn't mean they've been proven to not be helpful. They just don't have the research background, okay. the body of research right. behind them to show that they could be helpful. Yes. And then we have things that I think we could call we're learning from experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, some already existing clinics uh, at UVM actually that try to deal with more of the mind and body mm -hmm. interface and have proven successful in many ways right. um, and are gaining their evidence base and we'd hate to not uh, pay attention to them because they may not have the ultimate randomized controlled trial like a drug for treating cholesterol might have. Right. Hmm. Um, cool. Yeah, and I think this is an area where there truly is no template for how to go about this. Right. Uh, this, will, right. this will be an area where we learn a lot. We, we're really curious to see Interesting. how these disciplines come together and, and what configurations give us the best outcomes for patients. And Is it because the number of patients aren't there to, to, to weigh and to monitor? Or like some of the modalities might, like acupuncture, I'm, I'm not signing up. So I would not be in that study. Is there not enough people who have had acupuncture that, that couldn't have, give you the information? Plenty have had acupuncture, but the studies or the funding for it's the not studies there. is oh, not, it's not there. there. Yeah. So right. our, 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 our study industry is, is heavily financed by pharma. Pharma, yes. Um, <laughs> and so some we of these that. interventions don't have uh, an infrastructure to support their uh, study. And yes, evidence-based classically is randomized controlled trials over large populations. Right. Um, uh, but there is emerging understanding that um, we un need to actually expand the pool to pragmatic research, um, look at effectiveness research, and focus on outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, in 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 you know in our relationship with the the Centers of Excellence, our focus is really going to be on the outcomes right. and the improvements for those patients, regardless of what services are provided. So, our intent is to kind of um, if you will, pay for it through a bundle mm -hmm. and not through a per, per event oh, payment, I see. Right. Um, right. which allows flexibility uh, for Dr. Porter and others um, to apply the treatments that work for those patients in front of them. Mm -hmm. 
It's very exciting, and, isn't and, it? And it's to great. put this in perspective, if you look at the use of opioids on a chronic basis to treat pain, you will find that the CDC, in its guide, came out and said there is not an evidence base to support this being a first-line modality of treatment. Opioids? Mm. Opioids. Yes. Oh, you for would think chronic, it was the end-all, be-all. No, for chronic pain. Oh, really? Well, well, not to treat you after your back surgery, but to treat you right, with a back right. pain for the next... And then they give you the Narcan to go with it. Right. So, so <laughs> we're dealing with uh, something that was already widespread, uh, but it was all that people had to turn to quite often. Mm -hmm. So it was turned to, but it doesn't enjoy the evidence base we would have wanted it to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And now we have emerging modalities that are not prescription written, uh, mm -hmm. but that are other modalities of pain management that are needing to have further research to really validate it. And they hold a lot of promise of causing much less harm. Yeah, and, and I would think much less costly, mm -hmm. some of these modalities. Right. Yeah. And if you look uh, yeah. at you know, insurance, obviously many insurances pay for prescriptions, depending on one's right. plan. Uh, but when it comes to some of these integrative modalities we've been discussing, some are paid for, some aren't paid for, some are paid for by one payer versus another. Uh, in the state government, at the Agency of Human Services, we're working with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid right. Innovation, CMMI, right. Because uh, they're interested in more comprehensive approaches to the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. but also comprehensive approaches to pain management. And they're the first to admit that, you know, the current Medicare and Medicaid systems don't, don't pay for things uh, in a way that would encourage their use. Um, and so they're trying to look for, at ways to enhance payment for those things since there are so many large numbers of people dependent on those two insurance right. pathways. Um, and we're trying to work with them in the same way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's good. Cool stuff. <laughs> no, it's in, exciting. in some ways, you're creating your own evidence-based treatment. And you're, in, you know, you're. Well, we're seeing what works. outcomes and, right. and seeing what helps people move forward. Right. Yeah. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've talked a lot about treatment, the different ways to treat, um, you know, uh, people who are struggling with substance abuse. Um, what are some of the main drivers that would push a patient into relapse um, while they're in treatment or, uh, or, what, or after treatment? Well, um, so we, we, are, yeah. we have unified ourselves here today in regarding uh, substance use disorders as chronic disease, right. just like diabetes, heart failure, you name it. Right. Um, so our definition of chronic disease is one that the patient will always continue oh. to have, even though we try interventions to try to improve their function and improve suffering. But at the same time, a chronic disease is subject to relapse and remissions. Huh. So um, a diabetic person may be adhering completely to the regimen that you have them on, but they may have done some different things in terms of their level of activity or their diet or the content of their diet right. that throw their blood sugars off. Um, we, that would be a relapse in their diabetes in a sense. Right. And to get to remission, they would have to return to the lifestyle pattern that they had previously. Uh, and you'd want to explore with them, well, what factors made you kind of go off the wagon here? Why are you eating so much more or exercising so much less? And you get into aspects of their life that help determine that, and you try to help them repair those. So Same they may always be substance. in a state of like going to psycho for psycho psychological help forever. Right. So I mean, so, someone oh, who who had the susceptibility and yeah. turned to opioids for one reason or another, but right. has remained stable for mm. a period of time, Huge. will always have that potential. Yeah. Um, and especially earlier in their course, because we've learned from brain chemistry studies that it takes many months, perhaps as many as nine to twelve months, uh, even when you're on medication-assisted treatment, for your brain to kind of get back to the way it was before yeah. you developed this problem in the first place. So it physically so changes your brain. It yeah. really does. Yeah. 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 So we only have a, a two and a half minutes left, and I would just like to wrap it up by what's next? What is your vision of what's the next step here? I mean, you're on the opioid 
Coordination Council, they're probably looking ahead. The yes. hub and spoke to me, mm -hmm. we're, we're really getting a lot of attention for that model. Mm -hmm. And will that be expanded? What, what's next? We want it all fixed quick. Right? <laughs> that's a great We're talking way next year, right? Yeah, and, so, and that's why the Opioid Coordinating Council has 23 recommendations, uh, right. which we're fleshing out report. and refining right. better, but 23. Yeah. But one big one is what we've been talking about right. today. It's not getting allowing people to get into this predicament. Well, prevention is what led. we've always talked about. And, right? and part of prevention yeah. is having this kind of structure in right. place so that we can manage pain in a much better way than we may have in the past. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. Mm -hmm. The hub and spoke is obviously for everybody who has the need for medication now, just assisted a, treatment. The hub, what's in the hub? What does that hub so look like? Uh, uh, it's, it's sort of like yeah. your pain clinic, everything's there? Yes, or it is actually a one-stop shopping, if you will. And then they send you to a spoke because specialized? Or? No, okay, so the okay. hub yeah. is really the complex pain management center, if you right. will. Uh, or addiction management center, where you can be inducted into the use of these medications that are so helpful in helping you, uh, but they also provide a lot of this comprehensive support around you, whether it be counseling or case management mm -hmm. needs, et cetera. Only because of federal prescribing regulations, hubs are the only place you can have methadone prescribed. Oh. And so methadone often requires a daily visit. And right. The hub is set we have up a methadone to, uh, clinic fitness. and a brufenorphin clinic here mm -hmm. in Berlin in my town. Yes. I was on the, so, I was on the committee mm -hmm. that, that uh, created right. it. Okay. So mm -hmm. anyone on methadone will be at the hub right. for sure. Right, I see. Many people, though, can actually have their opioid use disorder treated as if it were another chronic medical condition in a primary care setting. We call that the spoke. Oh, so it's actually I've transforming the treatment of substance use problems right. into a chronic disease model, okay. a primary care manageable model. Excellent. Most of those patients will be on buprenorphine, yep. and buprenorphine can be prescribed monthly, yep. uh, and patients will not have to visit that spoke yeah, daily. Because they even give it to take home now, um, yes. They, yes. some forms, Yes. if yes. they and, know you're going to respond. And, and that is what happens. And there's also access to all the other services right. that are kind of built into a bundle, as we term it, uh, of care. So, so that works very well, and it really takes that disease and destigmatizes it. Yeah. Because when you're sitting in your primary care doctor's office, we don't know if you're there for oh, a cold right, or right. diabetes nope. or to get buprenorphine. I, I, we, um, we've actually run out of time, but I, when we had our the buprenorphine um, system here, I was surprised who came to me and said, "My mm -hmm. son, yes, my daughter." Yes. It is people that are yep. well known it's in the community, society. professionals. I mm -hmm. I was very amazed. They and said, neither. "We want this." And they're highly functional yeah. folks in recovery yeah. or living full yes. lives. Well, living with a chronic You have condition. your hands full, gentlemen. I really thank you all very much. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot, which is always good. As, as I told you, this is a video. Um, this is series number six in a series of eight videos that we're doing to help Vermonters understand about the opiate crisis. I had hoped that you will go to the Opiate uh, Coordination Council's website. Um, they'll be done in the next month in June, and you'll have all of the information you ever wanted to know about opioids. Thank you all very much. See you next week. Thank you.